All right, welcome back from lunch, everyone. It is time for the keynote. We've got Casey Ellis with us, uh, founder, co-founder of Bug Crowd. And very excited uh, for Casey to join us this year. If you don't know, one of our traditions is the previous keynote speaker picks the next keynote speaker. So Ben Sadegapur uh, picked uh, Casey, and Casey was able to do it. And we're thrilled to have him here today. Nice, nice. Thank you. Hey, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Adrian. Excuse the pause yeah, yeah. there. Um, Adrian was telling me about the, uh, the walk on music and uh, the, the thought he'd put into that. So I was just trying to clock the track. But yeah, good choice, Ben. Appreciate it. So good to be here in Knoxville. Um, I've, I've heard tons about this conference. It's actually the first time I've spoken at B-Sides Knoxville and indeed the first time I've actually been to Knoxville. So sorry, um, but also thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's been really cool to meet some of y'all and, uh, and get to know the town. So the talk today is uh, Release the Hounds Part 2, 11 years is a long ass time. Um, <clears throat> basically, we started, and forgive me for the sound futzery as well, that's um, almost entirely my fault, especially when I nearly blew everyone up in the section walking in front of the speakers, well, apologies for that. So we started Bug Crowd 11 years ago. Um, <clears throat> the industry looked very different then. Uh, basically, what this talk is about is, is that journey, um, and you know some of the things that I think it infers for entrepreneurs. I won't get ahead of myself on that. There's stuff that's changed in terms of the landscape for hackers. There's stuff that's changed for entrepreneurs. Hackers make really good startup founders, and you know folks that have ideas in this room. This is partly for you, and then folks that are hacking things or considering soliciting hacker feedback in your organization. This is for you guys as well. Um, shout out to Ben, uh, as, as Adrian mentioned before. I was uh, it was actually a really nice. Gesture. Ben's been a part of <clears throat> our industry for a really long time now, probably eight or nine years. Um, and to get this message from him uh, last year to come and uh, chat with y'all was, was you know, nice to hear from him and obviously a privilege to be here, as I've mentioned. Um, so let's do the things here. Sorry, we've had some, uh, some setup stuff. You can tell I'm out of practice, right? It's like COVID and you get back into the real world thing. You've got to plug the laptop in and make sure it works and all that stuff. So here we are. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is a two-pronged talk. It's about what I've seen in the industry and specifically the relationship between hackers and defenders over the past 11 years. Um, it's also about what it's like to build a startup, right? I started Bug Crowd at an industry inflection point. Um, you know, when we kicked off, people didn't really care about cybersecurity. It was like people like myself and Adrian and others that have been around for a while, like screaming from street corners trying to get people to listen. Um, we're now at a point where we don't have to do that anymore. And this talk is partly about the journey to that point. Um, but it's also about what it infers for those of you who are looking to disrupt, who have ideas, who have kind of innovation sort of inside of you. Like, if I can do it, anyone can, right? You can hear that I talk funny. That's always, you know, a, an interesting starting point when you land in America and try to build something. Um, as an Aussie, we've got a bit of as an Aussie, we've got a bit of a head start, but not that much of one. And you know, I think sharing our experience, we good. Keep going. Where, Where is the sound guy? There he is. Hello. Um, sharing that experience, I think, you know, as an encouragement, I mean, basically why I started, I wanted to change the operating environment for good faith hacking. I wanted to create a new market by disrupting the economics of attack versus defense. And as a personal thing, you know, I, I'm just kind of obsessed with this idea of the pursuit of potential, um, you know, for myself and, and to whatever degree I can inspire, inspire it in others. So that's what I'm going to cover off today. Um, and we're off to a bumpy start, but we'll settle into it. So everyone good? Give me a, give me a wave. Y'all here? All right, rock and roll, very cool. So yeah, Australian born, lives in San Francisco. Um, uh, founder, chair, CTO of Bug Crowd and co-founder of the Disclose IO project. Um, basically, we pioneered crowdsourcing as a service at Bug Crowd. We didn't create vulnerability disclosure or bug bounty programs, that was prior art. But this idea of putting a platform in the middle of all of the creativity that exists in, in the good faith security research land, of which many of you are a part, and all of the creative problems that need to be solved by defenders before the bad guys solve them, we were basically the first to kind of initiate that idea. And that idea at this point in time is well and truly out of the garage. Um, I'll get to sort of some of how we've grown. Um, <clears throat> basically, you know, my job is to see around corners and, and build things that will be relevant into the future. Um, you know, I consider myself from a career standpoint as a founder, um, took me about 35 years to reach that conclusion, bouncing around between all sorts of different things. But that's kind of my job, and that's what I do at Bug Crowd, and it's sort of the essence of the talk. But the background of that, growing up as a hacker, kind of tripping over into pen testing um, before it was like an established career path, and I'm sure there's a lot of you in this room that have that story as well, because 
our generation, that's kind of how we got into it. Uh, moved across onto the dark side of solutions, architecture, and sales, and then broke bad and became an entrepreneur, and, and Bugcrowd's the eventual result of that. Uh, also very involved in policy. Um, I think one of the things, you know, going back to what I was saying before about creating a, a more favorable operating environment for hackers that operate in good faith, that requires changing the law. Um, so, you know, we started working on basically petitioning the DOJ to, to make changes to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in 2016. And they just did that at the beginning of last year with some of the charging rule changes. We've been involved in DMCA, some of those other kind of anti-hacking laws that <clears throat> have a purpose. Like you've got to be able to, you know, cloud up and rain on bad guys from a legal standpoint. But if that chills good faith security research, then you're doing it wrong. So how do we fix that problem? So been pretty involved in that, election security, all sorts of other stuff as well. It's a, it's a fun ride being a founder. So what's the, what's the origin, like why is this talk called Release the Hounds? When we first started Bug Crowd, we had this kind of tradition of every time we'd launch a new program, we tweet Release the Hounds. Um, because back then it's like, well, this is scary. Like hackers are like bad and this is clearly a badass thing that these people are doing that Bug Crowd's involved in. So we kind of worked with that a little bit and, and you know, hammed it up. And Smithers released, released the hounds. Um, just a baseline, who's a, who's a bug hunter or in vulnerability research in, in this room here at the moment? Okay, some of you. Who knows what a bug bounty or a vulnerability disclosure program is? Mostly everyone, that's helpful. Um, I was gonna ask who's a bug crowd employee, but I think that's no one in, in this particular part of the world, so I'll skip that one, but it's all good. So, you know, this is 2013. So the part one version of this talk was, was uh, a talk that I gave at a Ruxmon at Google in Sydney before we came over to San Francisco for the first time. Um, and at that point in time, we'd run, it's up here somewhere, somewhere around 20 programs. Um, and we actually started off doing this as crowdsource pen testing. So it wasn't bug bounty in the sense that people think of it today. It's like if you can take a pen test budget and apply it to a group of people that have skills instead of just a singular, individual and have them actually compete or collaborate to find results, you're most likely going to get better quality results because the right people will connect with the problem. And that's just kind of a math thing that, that works, right? And um, yeah, so I gave this talk and, and you can see some of the things that um, you know, we were kind of learning at the time. Um, we didn't actually have a platform at that point in time. We just kind of yellowed it uh, for about the first four or five months until we came over to SF. And, and this is kind of what it looks like at the start. This was about four months in. You know, 1,500 testers, 10 bounties, there it is. I was looking for that before. Um, 1,500 testers, one of the things that was really interesting about starting Bug Crowd was the appetite that clearly existed amongst the hacker community to help. Um, and that was part of the reason I started the company. It's like there's all of this resource available in the community that's basically been at the table the entire time. They've just never been extended the invite, and instead they're oftentimes treated like criminals. So how do we fix that? How do we plug you know, this, latent, you know, uh, this latent capability, this latent potential in with this unmet demand and actually use that to, to drive things forward? Um, and as you can see, you know, some of the folks I was asking about VR and didn't get too many hands there, but a lot of this stuff's still the same um, from, a, from a crowdsource security standpoint. If you launch a program, you get a thousand people who are super enthusiastic saying, you've got click jacking or you've got you know, some of these kind of really benign vulnerabilities that are actually more a product of the fact that building stuff on the web is kind of hard, right? Um, that comes in, but then the more interesting thing comes, the more interesting stuff comes in downstream from that. Um, <clears throat> this particular slide turned out to be pretty accurate. Um, keep in mind, this is, what, five months after we, we'd actually kicked off in, in any form or fashion, so it's working, mostly. Still a lot to learn. I still feel like that most days uh, in, in terms of how to you know, plug hackers into cybersecurity as a problem set as it evolves. Um, I think there's, like learning is kind of fundamental to that because when you think about what we all do, we're not really meant to be here in the first place, right? Like no one builds a company intending for it to be vulnerable and no one builds a company with the plan for it to be attacked by someone other than competition. So if you sort of extend that out, our entire industry is kind of built on unintended consequence, which means it's constantly evolving. Um, so I think there's always something to learn, which is kind of, I find that kind of a, thre a freeing kind of mental model to view what we do through, because um, you know who gets frustrated sometimes when people aren't listening. We're trying to help them do the right thing. They're like, "Yeah, I don't get it." You know, viewing it through that lens, I think, can actually help. So, yeah, this all turned out to be pretty accurate. Uh, this is actually the first. This is where I had the idea. Um, so, yeah, co-founders. I had uh, two co-founders um, in the origin of the company. I worked on it on my own for about probably four months before I brought those guys in. 
So you know, we, we sort of think about it like that. Um, but that was kind of the room where it happened. Uh, and just after we came to San Francisco for the first time, this is one of my co-founders, Serge, that was in a big co-working space in, in SF. So pretty much we went through an accelerator. Yeah, you know, we delivered a bunch of proof in the first four months. We'd actually done a deal with Google at that point in time, which was a total like random thing. Like how that happened for the folks that are in the room thinking about this type of thing. I had a mentor who had done some really cool stuff and he basically said, well, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. So just go and ask them. And I did. And they said yes. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a valuable lesson, right? Um, and then all of a sudden we're here in San Francisco. So yeah, this stuff, I'm going to frame it up in a way that sounds like a lot of it was by accident. It wasn't. Like it was a product of a lot of very deliberate decision making. But kind of what I'm trying to color in here is that like it's not actually that, some of these things aren't that hard. They're just principles that you pick up along the way, you implement them, you execute. If they don't work, you throw them out, you move forward, lather, rinse, repeat, right? So this is the platform in December of 2012. It's actually a Wufu form, or actually this is a Kickoff Labs form. Um, there was a Wufu form that we used for bug intake. Um, we ran with that literally until we flew to San Francisco. My, my other co-founder, Chris, coded up a prototype of the platform on the flight from Sydney to San Francisco in order to pitch VC. Because at that point in time, what we had was proof of the fact that the crowd was there and they were willing to help. And if we plugged them in, we could find really badass vulnerabilities and actually deliver you know, increased kind of return on investment in terms of how much risk you understand you need to actually reduce at that point in time. So we had those things in place. We also had it in place that the market thought that pen testing was kind of a bum deal in terms of the economics. Like if I'm spending you know, $2,000 a day on something that I have no guarantee on the output from, and I don't really understand what they're talking about anyway, that puts me at a disadvantage. So how do you kind of level out the economic, you know, caveat emptor um, equation there? So we had the, all of that in place, but we hadn't actually cut code yet. So um, Chris Rathke, my co-founder, who's awesome, like literally banged out a version, a, a prototype on the flight. And when we went off and did the Sand Hill Road thing, when we landed in San Francisco, that's, that's what they all saw. But this is what we were running on prior to that. This is our first program in, what is that, the 30th of November, 2012. This is like WordPress. I just wrote some words and said, hey, go hack this thing and here's what we're gonna do. And it worked, right? Like this is ghetto, like this is janky, right? Agree? <laughs> you, see what, you see all the stuff that we're doing now and all the stuff I kind of laid out in, in my introduction, like it didn't always look like that. Um, and that's a, a part of why I'm trying to take you all through this. Um, yeah, 500 bucks uh, in total is the first crowdsourced public pen test that we ran, and, and it worked. It was a, it was a Rails app that I'd built as an out-of-office auto-reply tool for Twitter back in the day, um, because I was bored or thought that was a good idea or whatever. Um, got a bunch of people to hack it, and I could code like securely-ish at that point in time, um, but the kind of creativity that got applied to that, that particular program, um, the, the top reward actually went to someone who found figured out a way to do injection through the Twitter shortener um, that actually popped up on an unlinked page and could trigger an on-mouse over XSS, uh, which is like not the end of the world, right? Like that's not, from a criticality or impact standpoint, it's not that big a deal, but the amount of creativity that went into that attack chain is the kind that you would expect from you know, a more serious kind of pen test or sort of engagement like that. So at that point, it's like, okay, this works in terms of actually identifying risk and finding out things that need to be found. This is actually going to do quite a good job of that. So that's what we took across to SF. And at the time, it was kind of nice. Like, who was in the industry in 2012 in the room? Right. They were good times, yeah? Do you miss them? I do. <laughs> I think the thing that's happened since is that you know, security as an industry has been commercialized. I think people know that we're, we're actually important um, in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, there's, there's you know, economics and there's capitalism that's associated with that and that creates opportunity for us. But I do occasionally miss the days of just YOLO, you know, rip good times, um, rollerblading and, and looking stupid uh, like, the, uh, like the movies portrayed us at the time. So that was kind of where we came in from, right? So we landed in the US and you know, one of the first things that happened um, as, a, as kind of a, a first time immigrant uh, you know, getting around, like learning how to use Lyft and Uber and all those different things that were kind of brand new to me at the time. Uh, I had this really profound conversation with a Sudanese Lyft driver um, that's really kind of formed a lot of my thinking around why people take defensive steps. Um, <clears throat> what he was talking about is like all security is the product of something bad happening, 
right? So when you think about when people actually go through the cost and inconvenience, it's either compliance. Compliance often has its origins in something bad happening as well. If people are doing it because they want to, it's because they've had evidence that that's important. Um, so you don't put bars on your windows unless you know you're in a bad neighborhood, right? Like certain people in this room maybe don't lock their front door when they leave because you live in a part of the world where you can do that and it's okay. Um, but if you're in parts of the world where that's not okay, you've either experienced it yourself or you've seen someone else experience it in a way that you actually understand that you need to go through that cost and that inconvenience to keep yourself secure. So this kind of formed a lot of, it's a bit of a pessimistic view on why people do security, but from an economic standpoint and from a social behavior standpoint, I think it's pretty accurate. Why I say that is that the, the, the month that we landed in San Francisco, this happened. Uh, <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I look at this, like looking back through the past 11 years, I actually look at this as one of the linchpin moments where the non-technical internet user realized that, oh, this cybersecurity stuff maybe matters to me. I don't know what the heck anyone's talking about. Um, you know, prior to that, it was, it was you know, rip good times, hackers and rollerblades and, and all that kind of stuff. But now all of a sudden, as a, as a consumer, as a part of like, the voting population, as a part of the buying population, I'm now thinking about this as something that impacts me, right? And I actually, you know, not to speak about in any direction about what, what Snowden did, but I actually think that was a positive consequence of, of all of this. It, it did catalyze the conversation in a way that I think was quite productive. Then what happens? All right, 2014, you've got Target and, and the retail breaches. So um, Eastern European and, and Southeast Asian crime gangs doing kind of a final hurrah on track to data in, in retailers. Um, I think 60% of the US population got its credit card popped that year. So now hacking happens, which is what we learned from Snowden, but now it's happening to me. Doesn't hurt yet. Now it does. <laughs> right? 2015, you've got that. That's pretty hard to insure against if you turn up in that breach, right? And I think a lot of people learned that the hard way. And a lot of people looked on and thought about, again, cybersecurity as this extension of pers personal physical safety. Humans think about physical safety all the time. We're, we're like literally born, we're biologically programmed to do that. And we're born and we're raised and trained to do that as well. Now all of a sudden we're starting to think about the cyber thing as an extension of that, that same kind of threat model that we have personally. And everyone's doing that all at the same time. Um, OPM happened this year as well, healthcare records. There was a lot of stuff that was uninsurable to go hack this year, and it was not good. Um, <clears throat> then this happens. All right, cool. Now they're hacking my country. Um, if I'm not able to defend myself in my personal space, I at least rely on my nation to be a proxy for that, but now they're hacking that too. Right, so you can sort of see what's happening. It's this ascending kind of awareness um, amongst the people that ultimately hold the checkbook that pays the companies that pay us, they're, they're starting to pay attention. They're starting to behave, they're, they're starting to change their behavior. They don't know what, they still don't know what the hell's going on, um, but they know they should be concerned and they're starting to you know, make that voice heard. I think between 2017 and 2020, we had this whole, like, that to me was really this kind of explosion of technology just in general, but then the bad guys rose to the occasion. So, you know, there's, a, there's an expression, um, in Silicon Valley, software is eating the world. Um, we kind of adapted that to say, yep, software is eating the world and the bad guys are eating the software. Um, you can see, I mean, you know, many of you would remember at least some of these breaches. It was just, it was chaos. It was actually a really fun time to build a security company because people don't care about risk in the same way when things are fine. Um, when things start to go a little bit wrong, then they're like, oh, okay, maybe we need to take this risk stuff ser seriously at the corporate level. And that was what was happening through that period of time. And then of course, our good friend, the pandemic. Um, so what have we got? We've got software is eating the world and bad guys are eating the software. 2020, we've got my employee's five-year-old is now responsible for my corporate attack surface. <laughs> that was new, right? Like everyone enjoy that. I, we actually bugged out. My family were, were living, so I've got a wife and two kids. We we're living in San Francisco and we actually got some little birdie told us what was about to happen from an airspace standpoint. So we booked a ticket and flew back to Australia the next day, um, same day that Trump declared emergency in the US and two days before Australian airspace shut down. So doing that not to get kind of cut off from family, but then we promptly got stuck there for two years because there was no one flying in or out. So that was, that was fun. That was my kind of very first world COVID problem, but it was definitely inconvenient. Um, you know, when you think about how that impacted 
the cybersecurity environment, all of a sudden you've got this expectation that we're still trying to figure out how to untangle today of, of the home environment being a predictable attack surface as an extension of the corporate network. And who else is in that environment? You've got your family, you've got your kids, you've got their friends, you've got you know, guests, all these different things. So that was you know, one of those things where it all got pretty interesting. <laughs> I was proud of this slide when I came up with it. Because so. <laughs> that's actually the year the, um, the, I mean, I think the thing that happened with the ship that year, um, I forget the name of it, the Evergreen. Evergreen, yeah. I think that's the company, there's a specific ship, but yeah. Um, we were learning a lot about supply chain in 21, right? Like Log4j, SolarWinds, there was a bunch of things that basically elucidated to the broader community stuff that we'd all been talking about for quite a long time, which is the fact that like the internet is literally built on a big pile of turtles. <laughs> like it's turtles all the way down. So when you're talking about you know, software supply chains, when you're talking about vendor risk management, all those different things, those are risks that we've been thinking about for a long time, but all of a sudden they became real. Um, and then what happens off the back of that? You get presidential EOs, you get moves to Congress, you get all those different things happening as well. So the internet is basically a large pile of turtles, 22 taught us that everything is basically a large pile of turtles that runs on top of the internet uh, with, with Colonial, and 23 is the machines are coming for our pile of turtles. <laughs> so here we are, right? Here we all are in 2023 as people that come out on a, on a you know, over, over the weekends to like be together, to, to network, to have community, to build, to learn, to teach, all those different things. And this is the environment that we're operating in. Um, and that sort of brings me back to the start of the talk. 2013 was an inflection point for Bugrat. We're at another one now, right? I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. But those, like, there's people in this room that that sets your spidey senses off straight away because chaos is a ladder. It's an opportunity to actually disrupt and create better things. That's something that I've always believed in, but I've kind of learned and demonstrated and to some degree proven through Bugrat. And I think it's something that applies to everyone, especially people in this room. So yeah, the phenomena that I'm talking about is that if it's repeated enough at the dinner table, it ends up at the boardroom, right? Like all of these conversations that I just went through were very public. There's this ascending story around security and all of a sudden, you know, the whole idea of, of um, <clears throat> like the SEC, for example, passing draft regulation or draft rules uh, about four months ago saying that um, there's going to be an expectation for publicly traded companies to be accountable to the amount of cybersecurity awareness or understanding they have within their board. So what the SEC is doing is saying, hey, this is not a nerdy thing that sits off in the corner anymore. This is a core business risk issue. And as you know, the kind of the arbiter of publicly traded companies in the US, like y'all need to be accountable for that and we need to help you figure out how to do that. So that, this is the direction that everything's moving in. We're super freaking relevant at this point in time. And I know sometimes when you're on the, on the coalface, it doesn't feel like that. But if you zoom out to look at things kind of the way I look at them, um, you can kind of see that's true, and hopefully I've painted that story. Also in Congress, so you know, I mentioned before about the CFAA, that took eight years to, to, to get those charging wheel changes through. Like it was not easy, it was not fast, um, and there was a lot of pressure from myself and a bunch of others that kind of work in the cyber policy trenches to, to get this stuff done. But all of the stuff I was just talking about that was happening environmentally was a catalyst, because all of a sudden security is an issue of retail politics, so you've got politicians paying attention, and those are all things that we've got basically at our disposal at this point in time to try to create better outcomes going forward. So, yeah, I actually moved this slide, so it's, it's gonna jank up my thing, but um, <clears throat> yeah, pretty much what I saw going into, you know, I mentioned this before, but it's, it's that whole idea of leveling out the playing field from a math standpoint. I'm not gonna actually go too far into this because it's, like I said, it's out of order. Um, but you know, to me, this is the demonstration. You know, to me, this actually applies to entrepreneurship and solutioneering in, in cybersecurity as well. When I, when I did this, you know, sitting with my iPad, triple screening or whatever it was at the time, um, it was this description of you know, this DNA that we all share in security. Like we think differently, we think upside down. We take assumptions, we invert them, and we see what falls out, right? I think that's the thing that, that sums people. And you don't need to self-identify as a hacker to do that, like I love speaking to hackers, but I recognize that that can be not as inclusive a term as hackers often think it is. So I'm talking about like literally everyone in this room has this ability because you're in this space. We're all a bit nuts here and that's a good thing, right? So like we're the ones that are saying, hey, like we want to pick up the rope, tag us in. Um, in this case, I was talking about 
good faith hackers versus the black hats on this side. But it applies to people, it applies to whatever you're working on. If, if it's threat hunting, if it's you know, blue team, if it's purple, if you're diving off into AI and ML and all that kind of new stuff that's coming over the hill, whatever it might be, it's the opportunity to really pick up the rope and, and do all that. So what were we doing as all of this chaos was unfolding? <clears throat> so this is our, our second office. Um, yeah, I showed the, the room where it happened in our first spot. This is our second one in San Francisco. I just love that photo. It just makes me feel kind of nice. Um, that was a, a really fun time. The early stages of building a company when it's working um, are a huge rush. Like, it's a thrill. Um, you, you're getting to do some really important stuff. You're getting to do things that you believe in. There's people coming alongside you. It's definitely heady, and you've got to watch out for that a little bit, but it's fun at the same time. Um, this is our second space in Minna Street, so this is when we're about 30 or 40 people. Um, this was another you know, really fun period where it's, it's still small enough that we're all kind of working on this together, but you know, large enough that we're actually making a pretty significant impact. Um, this is the office that we have today in San Francisco, which is empty right now. We basically you know, stopped coming to work after COVID and then promptly everyone kind of moved out of SF because people do that. Apparently they all moved to Knoxville, I've heard. Is that right? <laughs> That's what the Lyft driver told me on the way here, so it's all good. Um, <clears throat> but that's something that we definitely experience. You know, at this point in time, we've got an office in SF, um, New Hampshire, London, Sydney, and Costa Rica. So we've kind of gone out, and um, it's out of out of the uh, out of the garage, so to speak, from a from a startup standpoint. 300 employees. We've raised 90 million bucks. Um, we've nuked around about a quarter of a million vulnerabilities and paid out 70 million to the crowd. Uh, 350,000 hackers signed up, of which probably about 10 to 15% are active at any given point in time, and about 850 customers. What's interesting about that customer list as well is like this started off as an idea in, in the Bay Area. Um, one of the things that's interesting about doing a startup is that you go to like innovative, you know, move fast and break things companies, and they think that's a cool idea. They're actually easier to sell to as customers, but we never thought of this as just a tech solution. It's like this is a across the board problem that we're trying to solve here. And if we get stuck in San Francisco, it's kind of like the lunatics validating the asylum. Do you know what I mean? You, you've got like Uber saying that what you do is cool, but everyone thinks that Uber's nuts. So uh, you know, you, you've got to at some point pivot out to convincing you know, financial services or you know, military and defense or you know, other kind of industrial sectors that are more conservative, that you're not just a tech solution, you're something that's relevant to everyone. And that's not to poo-poo tech, by the way. I think it's, it does a, plays a really important role, but that was our strategy. We ended up in a position where we were working with the DOD in 2015. We started hacking cars at the end of 2015, um, moving really heavily into financial services around 2016, um, medical devices. We got involved in election security in 2018, and it just goes on and on and on. So that's kind of how we've, we've grown. <clears throat> and not to get too pitchy on this, but this is what we've built. It's basically a dating website for people that break computers, is, is, is how, I, how I like to explain it. There's two problems that bug crowd solves. One is the fact that listening to the internet is hard, right? And, and basically, if you've built code and if you've got it in a place where everyone can look at it, there's probably something that's broken and someone's going to try to tell you that. So how do you let them? Um, what Disclose.io does is how do you create a legal environment around that where they feel safe doing that and where you feel safe actually asking them to do that? Uh, and if you do a bug bounty, that's when you basically add rewards to that and incentivize it. The other side of what we do is, is really getting access to rare talent. So, you know, a fun example of that is, is the work that we've done in vehicles. You know, automotive cybersecurity is a really very bizarre space. I actually just came from Hack the Capital, and, uh, you know, ICS and, and BMS type stuff is, is similar in its nature because you've got Windows NT, you've got, you know, Lambda running in the, cr in, in the cloud with APIs in front of it and all kind of the modern, um, you know, cloudy type stuff. And then you've got QNX and custom silicon and all of these different things all together operating as an ecosystem. And finding people that can actually address all of the potential value modes in all of that is hard, right? So that's, that's the other side of what we do, and that's the dating website piece that I mentioned before. It's actually a pretty accurate way to describe what we've built, because you know, the traits of the researchers, we collect those, and then the traits of the targets, we collect those. And it's not, oh, you do web stuff, and this is a website, so that's a match. It's actually going through what's maximize the probability of discovery of a vulnerability or you know, romance, if you think about it, um, in the past, and how could we actually kind of maximize that? So that's, that's kind of what we've gone and done. So yeah, that's the pitch. Um, hopefully that wasn't too onerous. 
And yeah, coming back to the whole idea of, of, of mission drive and appealing to the entrepreneurs and the folks that actually want to disrupt and change make in the room, um, you get to do some really cool stuff. Like we've, we've you know, unlocked, uh, where are they? Yeah, we've unlocked basically economies or people that were disconnected from, from being able to actually service a Western economy, giving them the ability to do this work and do that in a meritocratic way. Um, that's been amazing. So going off and educating a whole bunch of hackers, we've been able to promote you know, women in STEM and diversity and inclusion in, into the space because I feel like we've come a long, we've still got a long way to go for sure. Um, but I actually do feel like we've come a long way as a, as a sector um, in, in the last 10 years. Um, you know, the, the different kind of political things and, and policy pieces and all that kind of stuff. That's a, always an interesting one for a gringo because, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting called on to talk to US policy and it's like, I'm not even, I don't even vote here, but that's okay. <laughs> it is a system level issue and I think that's, that's some of the input that we all get to have, right? So switching gears into thought ops, um, <clears throat> yeah, what does it take to, to disrupt the status quo and security? These slides are going to be online. I realized before I got up and uh, all this sort of stuff that I had way too much content to cram into, into 45 minutes and I do want to have some time for questions, so I'll just blast through this and we can do that. Okay, let's start here. <laughs> This one's always fun. Um, I think through the, through the last 10 years, uh, there was a period, you know, 2015 or so, where it was peak insanity from, from the VC side in terms of AI is just gonna make all of the people problems go away. Let's forget about the human element and just bet on technology and automation, which was never true. Um, I think even now with stuff like ChatGPT and, and generative AI coming out, it's still like the Iron Man suit, right? Like the, the suit without the human is not as smart as it needs to be and the human without the suit is weaker than they could be. So you put them together and good stuff happens. You know, from my perspective, cybersecurity is a people problem. Um, you know, the technology just makes it go faster. Like, the idea of someone leaving their front door unlocked and someone else exploiting that predates the internet by a couple of thousand years, right? We've just sped it up. So, as a mental model to apply to how we do what we do, I think that's useful. Um, broke, uh, a more perfect security solution is a better security solution. So the technologists in the room, including myself, sometimes they always guilty of this one. It's like, that's not right. It's gonna be right, otherwise it's not secure. There's no such thing as secure. Yeah, you know, like once we figure out what secure looks like, it's the bad guy's job to innovate past that and tell us the next thing that we need to work on. So, you know, when you think about solving security problems to 100%, it's a question of whether or not that's actually the right way to think about it when you're thinking about a system level solution or something that you're trying to disrupt or innovate with. Yeah, you know, to me, a better security solution makes secure easy and insecure obvious. And if you're trying to have that as your fundamental design goals, then good things happen. Um, vulnerable disclosure is an external virtue signal. Hey, everyone, we're running a VDP. Like, look at us, we're fine, it's all good. Uh, and then not doing anything with the reports or, or whatever else broke. Um, that is a value proposition of actually launching a VDP, but if you stop there, then you've missed out. To me, the thing that's really important about vulnerability disclosure and actually kind of presuming the fact that like, Humans write my code, humans aren't perfect, therefore there's gonna be mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes will create vulnerabilities. That's a, takes, it takes humility to admit that as an organization. And I think the really powerful thing that we see as a, as a downstream consequence of this is that humility actually informs better security decisions going forward. So you're actually changing the culture. It's not just about going out and saying, hey, look at us, right? Bug bounty is a vulnerability swatting silver bullet. I always get accused of saying bug, bug bounty is the solution to everything. I've actually never once said that, but people think I have um, for some reason. To me, the thing that's most powerful about a bug bounty is that you know, it helps engineers even internalize the fact that the boogeyman's actually real. Um, it hits completely different when you have your code hacked by some kid halfway across the planet to, to how it hits when your red teamer comes over and taps you on the shoulder. Because you know, the first question you ask is like, okay, is he friendly or is she friendly? Seems so, but what are their next door neighbor like? Like what's, what's, you know, what's the actual potential for, what's the probability calculus of, of how I'm thinking about risk in this equation? Because I've just had it demonstrated to me that someone outside the organization can get in. Changes how you think, right? If you can make people internalize the fact that this is real, then all of a sudden we don't, we don't have to do as much of the chicken little kind of running around thing, which is good, I think, because they get tired of that. Uh, pen test is an assurance only model. Um, that's broke. I think the idea of going out and saying, cool, we've done, we've followed a methodology, we've checked all the boxes in terms of what should have been tested, therefore we're fine. Like, absence of proof is not, sorry, proof of absence is not absence of proof. 
Uh, and I think we're at a point now where the industry is actually starting to understand that like, we've got a lot of stuff to fix here and just having a look at things is not actually a solution to the problem. It tells us that we've had a look at things and that's it. So combining assurance with a priority around impact and finding critical issues, all of a sudden what you're doing is, is ticking that compliance box, but also creating those build or breaker feedback loops that I was just talking about in the last slide. Um, broke, China wouldn't bother with my stuff. Nation state, I meant to redact that. So I gave this talk in Australia, sorry, China. Um, but you know, nation states of whatever variety wouldn't bother with my stuff. Uh, you know, again, old, old guy telling a story. Um, you know, I think there was a period in the history of bug crowd where there was this idea that like nation states have higher priorities um, than, than most of the organizations that would be represented in this room and, and most of the places that I've spoken at, you know, sans the government ones, right? Um, SolarWinds told us that that's not true. You know, they, they might have only exploited a couple of different agencies, but they had shells everywhere. You know, one of the things that got, got observed um, right off the back of, of the news of COVID kind of breaking out was certain nation state actors going out and just hosing everything they possibly could um, to get shells for later. Um, and that's, that's a thing, like supply chain attacks, we learned in 22, that's a real thing. The internet is built on turtles, right? So, you know, this idea of, of being able to constantly protect and de like deter an attacker like that, and just assume that's gonna be okay, I'll, I'll go off and deal with the low hanging fruit. I think that's an unstable assumption at this point in time. Last one, who is, so security researchers in the room? Quick one, show of hands, anyone? All right. So as a security researcher, prior to you know, doing a company and getting a cell phone, and now it's like the older I get, the better I was, um, basically the experience of trying to get a vulnerability to an organization and having it go into a black hole is bad for security, it's bad for the community, it's intensely frustrating, and you know, honestly, industry can do better. Um, Bug Crowd can help you do that, but you don't need our help. I think it's just something that everyone should do, and this is a soapbox I'll stand on for a long time, so I'll keep moving on. But this is where Disclose.io comes in. It's basically an open source, free set of boilerplate templates to help your lawyers write a vulnerability disclosure policy that makes sense, that doesn't freak them out, and that actually provides safe harbor for the hackers and for, for the recipient organization as well. So that's one that you can just jump in and use. Um, Bug Crowd, the, uh, the links are on the bottom there as well. So just real quick, because I'm getting wrapped up. Um, what comes next? I'm just going to buzz through these. Threat actors will continue to blur together. Um, you see that with, with cybercrime, nation states, the stuff with ransomware and the different things happening with sanctions. It's all kind of merging into one big blob of badness. Um, so this idea of understanding the motivations of the threat actor, I think that's another unstable assumption and an opportunity to innovate and to think about how to do defense better. If you can't control who's going to rock up, how well can you control what they're able to do once they get there, right? Um, chaotic threat, act threat actors will re-enter the chat and will be totally unprepared. Thank you, Adrian, for the conversation last night where this <laughs> came up. Um, Laps has taught us that you know, the last time we dealt with a threat actor that we have no idea what their intent is was LulzSec, and that was 2012. So in the meantime, we've been thinking about this as a, as a symmetric thing where we can actually understand what the threat actor wants and we can behave appropriately. That's in the process of breaking right now. Um, cybersecurity will continue to shift from capability-based towards being risk and value-based. The business cares about what we do. They don't understand it. It's actually our job to help them know that. Um, I really appreciated the metrics talk before because I think those sorts of things, that's the language of the business, and that actually helps us partner together to do a better job as a whole. Um, AI, drink, got it in there. There we go. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll accelerate the defender's dilemma to the point where we'll actually need to reboot our view of the game. So the idea of that, um, that tug of war thing that I was talking about before, every time the bad guys get tools or every time the good guys get tools, the bad guys adapt their tools to overcome what we're doing, right? Um, AI has just dumped a whole bunch of tools and a whole bunch of capability on both sides and the adversary is using it. They're paying attention, they're evolving, they're adapting and there's, I think, a pretty unpredictable kind of growth path of how that's gonna play out that we actually need to plan ahead for um, because at some point in time it just gets too much, right? So that's, a, that's an interesting one to think ahead of. And again, this is not doom and gloom. To me, I, I look at this stuff and I think opportunity. Like if you're thinking about this as an innovator, as a disruptor, it's like, okay, how could I solve that problem? It seems stupid. You know, my idea of, of plugging hackers into banks in 2012 was ridiculous. Going out and pitching it to most people, they're like, are you on drugs? Like this doesn't make any sense at all. And there's similar kind of opportunities that exist right now that you all could take on. Policy will play a key role. Our primary problem will continue to be 
reminding people to wash their hands after they use the restroom. I'm sorry. Security is still boring sometimes as well. So some thoughts there. So how's that idea coming along? Hopefully this has all been educational, inspiring, useful. Um, finishing off with a couple of things here. Do not follow the path set by others. Instead, make your own path and leave a trail. One of my favorite quotes. I love this guy. I've already said all this stuff, so I won't uh, go back over it other than the last bit, henceforth and be rad. Um, and yeah, um, final, this is Bug Crowd's patron saint. Those of you who might know that Grace Harper has a posse t-shirt. She's just phenomenal. If, um, you know, for anyone who actually doesn't know who this is, I encourage you to go look her up because she was an innovator, she was a disruptor, she was a teacher, she was a w woman in tech at a time where that was almost impossible, um, including, you know, being in the military and, and rising to the station that she did. She's just a true inspiration. So I will leave it there. Thank you.